Welcome to the Manual Channel. I'm your host, Dan Gall, and today's guest is Luke McKinley, Marketing Director of Novo Fogo Kashasa. But before we dive in, don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe. And with that, let's go. Welcome to the show, Luke. Thanks a lot for having me, Dan. Happy to be here. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm really excited to talk to you about Novo Fogo. Um, and also, it's just kind of cool to reconnect with a fellow University of Washington alum. Uh, I used to live in Seattle, and uh, you live in Seattle. So curious, living in Seattle and working with a Brazilian uh, rum brand, how has that influenced your journey there at Novo Fogo? Great question. We're very lucky to have kind of two footholds in North America and South America. Novo Fogo's origin is in the south of Brazil, but our North American HQ is here in the Seattle area. And we think that both places actually share a lot in common, despite being like 6,000 miles away. We share a love for nature, surrounded by a beautiful place. So there's definitely, despite the distance, a lot of cool overlap that informs a lot of how we think about our business and just how we, how we live every day. Do you get an opportunity to go down to Brazil and visit the distillery and other aspects of the business? I do. Yeah, it's one of the great privileges is sharing our really incredible place with people who've never been to Brazil before. So I usually go one or two times a year. I'm actually going to be going in, in two weeks, taking a small group of bartenders down who won a cocktail competition last year. Um, and that's just one of the, the coolest parts of this job and the greatest privileges is being able to share our very unique really mesmerizing place with the outside world. And whenever we get to go there, it is just so much to soak up and so much learning to always take place. So speaking of sharing, can you share uh, the story behind the founding of Novo Fogo and basically what inspired their focus on Kishasa? Um, yeah, so the story behind Novo Fogo um, is the distillery was founded in 2003 by um, an ex uh, Volvo, head of Volvo operations in Brazil named Fulgencio Torres Viruel. And from the very beginning, he had a vision of producing traditional cachaça, artisanal cachaça, but doing things the right way, farming sugarcane organically, establishing zero waste practices from the jump. And fast forward um, about a dozen years or less, um, and our founder and CEO, Drago Shaksinte uh, had this idea. He was, he was passionate about the country of Brazil. His previous company had taken him there and um, saw this massive opportunity to share artisanal cachaça and the wonders of Brazil with the North American market. So we had this idea, as with many Latin American spirits companies, to start a brand, find a distillery, and partner exclusively with it to bring it to the United States. And so he, he and his wife, Emily, traveled all over the countryside of Brazil, meeting with distillery owners and producers. And they found this like truly astonishingly perfect fit in kindred spirits in this little teeny tiny town in the south of Brazil, tucked away in the Atlantic rainforest, a uh, little town called Mojeches. And um, that was in about 2008 to 2009. The Novo Fogo brand was launched in uh, right around 2010. And I was actually reviewing our, our business plan that Dragos wrote during that time. And it is extraordinary how the ethos of the business, even then, is extremely similar to what we practice every single day now. Um, the design of that deck looked quite a bit different from, you know, from what the brand identity looks like today. But the fundamental values of leaving the world a better place than we found it through these really delicious spirits were always that, that, um, that ambition from the jump. So it, it's, it's really a treat to be able to see that like the, the through line, the thread of our company has maintained, um, you know, years, years down the line. In 2015, um, our businesses became one. So Noble Fogo is now, we're essentially a totally fully integrated company. Our brand is based here in the United States. Our production, you know, we, we own our distillery. We're, we're an independent company. So we, we, it's, for me as the marketing guy, it's a treat to be able to get on the phone or have, share WhatsApp messages with my colleagues in Brazil and share the stories of what's happening in the environment in real time um, because we have that, that connectedness. We're, we're, we're one, one team, one company from North America to South. So you, you've mentioned a, a few key, key phrases there, uh, which kind of lead into like, how Novo Fogo uh, 
shaped the business and their day-to-day operations and their marketing strategy. So kind of like their vision and mission, leave the world a better place, uh, you know, uh, and then some projects or project that you, that you all have as a business. Can you kind of enlighten us on what those are, what, what the vision and mission are and, and what you all are doing? Absolutely. The vision and mission of Novo Fogo is really informed by a sense of place. And that comes from, the day-to-day realities of being, I mean, effectively what we are is we're a sugarcane farm and a distillery, an artisanal distillery in the middle of the rainforest. So the day-to-day operations and realities that face our business are truly shaped by the landscape and the nature that surrounds our sugarcane fields, right? Um, And I remember 10 years ago, first time I went to Brazil, I was curious to see if the place truly lived up to the stories that I had heard and the pictures that I had seen. And it, it truly does. It's, it's, a, it's a really precious place. It's one of the most uh, uh, biologically biodiverse places on earth. And, and the nature, the kind of purity of the air, the, the, the clean rainfall that we get has a very real impact on the sugar cane that we grow, right? So all of this is to say that the ethos of Novo Fogo is very much informed by preserving and coexisting with the landscape around us in southern Brazil. Um, And as you can see from some of the images that are on screen right now, it's just the proximity between rainforest and sugarcane fields is is right next door to each other. Um, So from a very fundamental just production standpoint, that's that's why we chose to be organic um, sugarcane farmers. And so Novo Fogo is a USDA certified 100% organic operation. Means, you know, we don't use any chemical interventions of any kind in the farming of our sugarcane. And that's not just you know a, a marketing checkbox. That's a very fundamental choice that was made years and years and years ago to do well by the nature around us. You know, because using chemicals would contaminate the the soil, the waterways around us, and would be terrible for the human beings that are involved very very fundamentally in crafting every drop of Novo Fogo. Right, those guys swinging the machetes in the sugarcane fields would be encountering those those nasty chemicals. So um, the preservation of place, the conservation and that kind of balance between making a business thrive and taking care of the nature around it has fully informed everything that we do from from the beginning. And I'm I'm, I'm really proud to look back and to see that those very uh, strong convictions have have remained and have only gotten stronger. And we'll talk a little bit later about how how that is more recently manifested in planting trees in the rainforest around us. Um, and some really exciting projects that uh, that uh, that we're up to now. So one of the projects, uh, from what I've read, is the unendangered forest. And what is the goal of that? I'm assuming it's how do you protect the rainforest uh, during not just how you all operate and distill, but uh, probably on a broader spectrum, right? That's right. Yeah. So th- there was a very um, how much time you got, Dan? Because this is I love talking <laughs> about Kashasta and I love talking about trees. You know, we've gotten to this point in our business where we think rather equally between making organic spirits and the the Atlantic rainforest. So to, to kind of synthesize, to, to distill all of this down, the Atlantic rainforest um, is kind of Brazil's second rainforest. You think of the rainforest in Brazil, everyone thinks about the Amazon, right? Well, really the, the first kind of prominent rainforest that is suffered a lot of transformation in Brazil. It's called the Atlantic Forest, the Flores Atlantica. And this is, as you can imagine, on the Atlantic coast of Brazil, it used to be a contiguous forest, forest three times the size of Texas, but it's also where all of the population in Brazil is centered. So you think of the massive cities, Rio, São Paulo, Florianópolis, Porto Alegre, those population centers have moved inland in the last two, 300 years have taken a lot of the forests with it. So the Atlantic forest is really kind of like, kind of a portent, kind of like, a, you know, bad things have happened to it for the sake of building a, you know, civilization that we hope are not repeated in the Amazon because that has even more dire consequences, right? So um, as Brazil developed in the 20th, 19th and 20th centuries, you know, building out cow farming, coffee farming, in some cases, sugarcane farming, timber logging, um, a lot of that really precious ecosystem was, was, cut down. So there wasn't, wasn't really much thought to sustainability moving forward. So that's the context in which Novo Fogo's business is. The largest protected patch of that rainforest is in our state, which is called Paraná State. So it's a, it, 
despite all of the destruction that has happened, it's it remains an extraordinarily biodiverse place with thousands of species of plants and animals and birds. Um, so it's truly a, a special place just to you know breathe in the air and see the trees that are home to other plants that are home to frogs. It's it's rainforest vibes at their peak. We noticed probably about circa 2016, when we were producing cachaças that we finished in Brazilian woods. We can talk about that later because that's one of the things that makes the cachaça category pretty unique is that aged spirits can be aged in, in woods other than American French oak. So uh, our master distiller is named Dr. Agenor Makari Jr. He's, he's an agronomist, he has a PhD. Uh, he wrote his dissertation in uh, Yerba Mate post-harvest technology. So he's He's a geek about Brazilian beverages of all kinds. He also runs a brew pub and he's a renowned cachaça educator, consultant, and we're super lucky to have him as our Dr. Cachaça. And in his laboratory has all of these different barrel, little barrels where he runs experiments on, on aging cachaça. Um, and we started our own line of, of what we call them two woods cachaças that aged American oak and then finished in Brazilian woods. And in trying to get more of these barrels, we noticed it was really tricky to get these from our cooper. There simply wasn't a big supply. And we wanted to know more about that. And in, in diving deeper into the realities of using Brazilian woods to age cachaça, we, we learned that a lot of these trees, and we're talking like the redwood trees of Brazil, right? Massive, noble hardwoods that are keystone species in, in a forest, right? You need these big trees um, because they play such a critical role for all kinds of other creatures, from microbes to toucans to monkeys, right? We learned that a lot of them, there are about a dozen woods used for aging cachaça. Um, and we learned that most of them are somewhere on that IUCN red list threatened groups, right? From endangered to vulnerable. Some are in the kind of least concern realm. So there's some positive direction there. So anyway, all of this coalesced for us in wanting to leave a positive impact on the environment that gives us so much, makes our cachaça so unique, so tasty. We knew we wanted to do some kind of reforestation project there are many brands across industries that do the kind of, you know, buy a bottle, buy a pair of shoes, plant a tree in the rainforest. And they do that by partnering with a third party uh, organization. They just pay the money and the trees get planted. But we wanted to keep it local. We wanted to have ownership over it. And we wanted to work with local partners so that it was truly a story that we could, we could cultivate from literally the ground up. So that was the kind of cachaca based origin of it. Fast forward to 2018, we partnered with a forest engineer named Dr. Sylvia Ziller, who is the scientific heartbeat of the project. She helped us create a list of species in our area that have been overexploited in the past. We work with botanists who scale the trees with climbing equipment, harvest seeds from these mother trees, we call them what mother trees that we identify in the wild, because you can't just like rock up to a nursery and, and get these seedlings. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then we raise those seedlings in, in a nursery uh, by our partners at Ecoa Park. We have all these ama this amazing constellation of, of partners in our little town who are very, share, share our desires to leave the Atlantic Forest a better place than we found it. And then we distribute them. We plant a lot of them on our own property, which is mostly covered in forest in addition to sugarcane. And then we distribute them to landowners who at this point number over a hundred, um, 125 actually. And it's just amazing to see this grow. I'll, I'll put some images up uh, from the back end of an app that we created in order to track this. Um, and you can see just on the map, all of the locations uh, where these seedlings are ending up and now it crosses two states. Um, Rick, well, how, state how long does it take to grow a Brazilian tree? Like to, from seedling up to where it could be potentially harvest for a barrel or not harvest, but be a, a mature. It's a really great question because the, the duration of time it takes to grow these trees has played a part in why they're cut down um, because they're super valuable. They take a really long time to grow. Um, this photo is, is of uh, an uh, Aradiba tree, a zebra wood tree that I found not too far from my distillery. And the landowner um, whose property it's on said he estimated that was about a 30 year old tree and it, it was probably maybe like less than a foot in diameter. So I can't imagine many barrels would come out of a tree like that. So um, a lot of these trees can take between 30 and 50 years to reach full maturity. Wow. All right. Um, so uh, 
if we could move into the distilling process real quick. So you talked mm -hmm. about there is aging in American oak and then finished off in the Brazilian burial. Could you talk about what that distilling process is like and why uh, that barreling process? Absolutely. Um, would you like me to, de to describe the process kind of from beginning to end or to focus mostly on the aging process? What's most, most interesting? Well, you know what? I think, you know, um, I'm not super familiar with cachaça and I know it's made, you know, from sugar cane, right. And there's a process to that. So I'm, I'm curious yeah. how, how does that differ from like, maybe like a, a, a Jamaican or Caribbean rum, right? Like, uh, and, uh, and then I think it's very unique that the finishing process is through a Brazilian burial. So like, why, like, what does yeah. that impart into it? Yeah, well, the two main things that make cachaça a unique spirit category are number one, it can only be produced in the country of Brazil. Um, so even though sugarcane grows all over the globe, can't call it cachaça um, unless it comes from Brazil. And number two, it must be produced from freshly pressed sugarcane juice. And that difference in raw material is the main thing that separates it from rums of all stripes. Um, it puts cachaça, if you're familiar with some of the rums, from, like from the French Caribbean called rum agricole, that's also made from fresh sugar cane juice rather than uh, molasses, kind of a byproduct of the sugar making process. They share that kind of funky, grassy character. Um, rum agricole are generally produced using column stills. So it has that elegant kind of drier, more refined finish. And cachaça in Brazil is made in typically one of two ways. There's industrial cachaça, which you can imagine what that means. It's made in big factories, massive farms, also col column distillation to try to just extract as much distillate as possible. And artisanal cachaça. And ar artisanal cachaça is what Noble Fogo produces. Um, that's made typically in, in these copper pot stills that you can see um, in small batches, single distillation. But that key piece, that fresh sugarcane juice, I think is, is the so what of cachaça because the flavor is just so much rounder and funkier and grassier. Um, it's a super diverse spirit category. There's something for everybody, but that's the main thing that makes it unique. And so for us, our sugarcane is harvested once a year, harvested by hand. Our field team, as you can see, they are experts with machetes. That sugarcane is then, it's, you know, sugarcane gets it starts to naturally ferment as soon as it's chopped down, especially if it's hot in the, in the jungle. So it's really important that it's pressed within 24 hours. So uh, our farm is on site. The distillery is right there. Sandro here presses it, extracts the juice. We also um, get a lot of pulp out of that, you know, just all of the leftover pulp from the sugarcane stock. And that for us is a really useful byproduct. We use that as like kind of a compost mulch, to put back on the sugarcane fields. And then we also burn it uh, to create heat uh, in our furnace steam to, to power the stills. The sugarcane juice ferments into, we call it wine, um, about 9% ABV within 24 hours, so pretty fast process. Um, and then that wine is distilled a single time in these copper pot stills. We only capture the heart of that, the best part of the distillate, and the rest we also recycle. Um, and so then we have cachaça, and that's one of the things that I think is really unique about the spirit category is that you can enjoy cachaça in clear, unaged, silver cachaça form, cachaça prata. Um, and then you can enjoy it like you would maybe in the tequila world in various steps, steps of aging, right? So you can drink a really fine añejo tequila, just like you can drink a very nicely aged um, cachaça. And in Brazil, aged cachaça is the way most folks prefer to like sip cachaça. Um, oak is the number one most used wood uh, for aging cachaça. Uh, this comes from just the history of um, uh, barrels that ended up in the country of Brazil and in more modern day, you know, it's just super sustainable and accessible for a company like ours to get American oak ex bourbon barrels on the, on the bourbon barrel market. Um, and so for those main reasons, that's why Noble Fogo really leans into using American oak. Um, for the kind of the history and the heritage, but also because of the sustainability, we can use them multiple times. And let's face it, everybody loves the flavors of American oak, right? That kind of toffee, vanilla, you know, the kind of cacao notes. It's delicious if you like drinking bourbon or aged rums or aged tequilas. In some way or form, we like that oak. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. And then, and then the Brazilian would, what does that do to it once it's moved into that barrel? Crazy things, man. Brazilian woods are, um, you know, they present a bit of an environmental pickle, like I described, but they can be really delicious. And in the last probably half century or so, producers in Brazil have been deliberately using these um, woods for aging or finishing cachaça. And I mean, for example, our first release is called Tanager, and we finished it in a Brazilian zebra wood barrel. And this, this type of tree, like a lot of tropical hardwoods, has a ton of resin in it. It's super dense. It's really hard to, to cut, even with the saw. It's hard to fashion into a barrel. Um, and because of that, some of our earliest bottlings of Tanager just soaked up a lot of that resin. Um, and so it turns a kind of amber honey colored liquid out of the American oak barrel into this rich red, you know, like really unusual appearance that when you even stir it in a cocktail, like with ice, that water, you know, kind of hits the, the resins, those, those lipids, and then Lucia's gets kind of milky, almost like a pastis. Um, so crazy flavors, very earthy, very tannic. Um, I usually taste people on that last because it's like kind of a palate monster. Um, but that's all because of the wood. We don't add anything to it. We don't, you know, mix any weird ingredients or additives into it. It's just that, that wood character. And then on the op opposite side of the spectrum, you have expressions like our colibri, uh, which is American oak finished in amburana, which would be like a Brazilian teak wood. And that wood has compounds in it related to called kumaru, which is related to the tonka bean. So if you've ever had that kind of like vanilla, there's not a lot of it in the United States, um, but that kind of like vanilla musky situation. Um, our, our colibri expression has a lot of that like baking spice, holiday spice, cinnamon, mm. and it blows people's minds because they're like, what kind of spices did you put into this? And it's simply because of the, the character of the wood. So they can be truly delicious. We always just have to kind of temper that. For us, our two woods expressions are, are reasons uh, in conversations like this for me to be on my soapbox about the need for sourcing very responsibly and and knowing like where your bells come from, making sure that they are in a place like Brazil sourced uh, responsibly and legally and sustainably. Yeah, and you you can feel good about buying it because you know you're supporting uh, some efforts for maintaining the environment and allowing for future generations to enjoy something like this, right? And uh, absolutely, I have this bottle of the Sophie Tucker collab uh, passion fruit uh, cachaça. Um, it's I I, I kind of you got me really jealous and 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 really <laughs> wanting to taste something out of the uh, Brazilian uh, barrel. I'm assuming this is not aged in the Brazilian barrel, right? This is probably just white oak. That's right. Yeah, and actually, that one starts out as our silver cachaça, but we made this like infusion extracted from our oak barrels to give it a little bit of that structure of oak. I'm gonna I'm gonna taste this while we keep talking, but uh, yeah, I have a question specifically. Well, one, I I think it's kind of cool. This this has a, a uh like a, a well, it's a cloth purple kind of a neck wrapper around this. Kind of cool. I don't know what's the purpose of of that. What's what's that signify? Yeah, so that's actually made out of recycled plastic bottles that are collected from the streets of São Paulo and then woven into a textile that mimics like a jute fabric. Okay. Um, so so and, like almost everything yes. you guys are doing is environmentally thought forward, right? A hundred percent. And it's functional too. You know, it catches the drips when you're pouring. Um, you know, if you're a bartender grabbing bottles by the neck out of the well, it's a little grippier, easier to hang on to. And for us, it's just, it's, it's one more aspect that allows us to connect, you know, the, in this case, the cool whimsical purple color. First time we've gone in a colorful direction with uh, something that's making the streets of Sao Paulo a, a little bit cleaner. I love it. So talk to me about the Sophie Tucker collab. Like how did, how did yeah. this come about? Yeah. So um, Novo Fogo's co-owners and global brand ambassadors are the uh, amazing people and also dance music superstars uh, duo named Sophie Tucker. Um, we at Novo Fogo were, were looking for um, kind of an accelerant, someone that could help us spread the gospel of cachaça, which is a growing category, still remains kind of esoteric to a lot of North Americans, just help us reach new audiences. And um, through a series of conversations, we got connected with Sophie and Tucker, um, who composed, so they're best friends who composed this band. Um, 
they've been Grammy nominated twice. They make incredibly fun music that's very kind of Brazilian influenced. They're both Americans. Sophie uh, lived for a time in Rio de Janeiro. So she's a Brazilian soul um, and a lot of, and sings in Portuguese and speaks great Portuguese, collaborates with Brazilian artists. And Tucker's a DJ and together their music is just really fun, positive. You can't really sit still when it's playing. Um, are, Dan, are you very from? Have you heard of their music prior to this conversation? I, I have heard of Sophie Tucker. I wouldn't say that um, they're playing every day um, uh, uh, on my Spotify, uh, but I'm very familiar with them. And and I, I am, cool. I, it is kind of, I, I one, I love collabs, right? And and I, and I just love, uh, I think they're always have some, usually an interesting story behind them of why a brand wants to be associated with, um, you know, another either brand or, or person or people. Yeah. And for us, it was truly a perfect match. They were looking for a collaboration, um, a business venture, and we were looking to have exactly the same sort of relationship. What was really important is that we weren't looking for just an endorser. We were looking for equity partners. And so Novo Fo or Sophie Tucker are equity partners, co-owners in our company. They have some, they have a lot of skin in the game, right? They're, um, very passionate about what we're doing. And very interestingly, Dan, the first time we sat down with them, we were at this cool Brazilian restaurant in LA um, and kind of sh right off the bat, Sophie's like, listen guys, I, I just want to throw something out. I don't drink alcohol. Is that going to be a deal breaker for you? And we were like, no, is that going to be a deal breaker for you? She's like, no, because I was so drawn to all of the other things that Novo Fogo does and stands for, the reforestation project, the organic agriculture, the zero waste, the carbon negativity, all of that is a brand that I can really get behind. And her ethos has really transformed how we think about our business. We're not just a spirits producer, we're kind of a drinks producer. Um, her, her outlook is like, look, I'm always at the party. I want that party to be inclusive, to be composed of people who wanna drink and consume whatever they want. You know, and I want to be the one making drinks for my friends. I won't be drinking them myself, but if I'm going to be making drinks, it might as well be something as, as cool and as uh, kind of world changing as Novo Fogo. But you, Tucker, you guys also make non alcoholic drinks. Were those inspired by her as well? 100%. Yeah. That wasn't even part of the deal. It wasn't like we will introduce something completely out of left field. You know, we, we have so firmly kind of like, partnered together. The collaboration is really special. We were like, this, this is a special sauce. And this vibe is worth creating a non-alcoholic product, which is not really a wheelhouse. So that Sophie now has something that, um, that she can rep wholeheartedly. It's kind of her, the, the product that represents her, that passion fruit cachaça that you're, you're drinking represents kind of Tucker. The Mate tea represents Sophie. And you can actually, we designed them so that you can mix them together in a super simple, eyeball um and so that's kind of like the sophie tucker we called it the the best friend highball which is the name of one of their songs um yeah so they they've been sophie tucker have been part and parcel of a lot of our product development which has been really exciting to see them you know just part of these conversations part of these development sessions literally tasting you know different iterations of flavors for that cachaça and for the mate tea when we visited our distillery in Mojitius. Um, as well as being, you know, fundamental to the packaging design. A lot of th their whole vibe is very colorful, very, you know, very Brazilian, very just like fun. And our packaging and our new ready to drink can cocktails um, in the drinky bottle that you have right there with the kind of more colorful label. Um, a lot of that is as a direct result of the collaboration between Sophie Tucker and Noble Fogo. So how, how were they involved in the making of this passion fruit uh, Kishasa. Like, were they? Was Tucker involved directly in this? Both of them. Yeah, from the very beginning. Because we knew, okay, this this collaboration is an opportunity to introduce the Sophie Tucker audience to Noble Fogo, to Brazilian drinks in a new way, right? And our product line, as it stands, is really diverse. We've got a lot of barrel age expressions. Um, our silver unaged Kishasa is probably the most uh, understood, the most mixed into drinks. But we we're like, why don't we get something develop something together that, you know, someone who might have not ever heard of cachaça before could just immediately pick up, enjoy, you don't have to overcomplicate the kind of drinks that you make with it. What kind of flavors should those be? 
it should be Brazilian. We started, you know, having these brainstorming sessions of, you know, all of the Brazilian fruits that we love. And we landed on passion fruit just because it's such a truly like one of the best flavors and experiences is like a caipirinha made with a fresh passion fruit, pulp, right? So we wanted to evoke that in a spirit that was organic, was all natural, was, you know, just like reflective of the delicious flavors that Noble Fogo has a reputation for. Um, and so they helped us at the very beginning kind of conceive this. And we went to Brazil together last year and we just got our hands dirty and we tasted everything. And even though Sophie Tucker does, or excuse me, Sophie does not um, imbibe, she was there helping with nosing, you know, helping with kind of developing the sensorial journey of opening up a bottle of, of passion fruit cachaça. And so where we landed was silver cachaça with that kind of funky sugar cane like foundation, organic passion fruit, a little bit of orange peel, organic orange peel, because we you know wanted a, a few other notes there to be supporting the passion fruit. Um, a little bit of organic cane sugar, a little bit of sweetness helps even in a spirit like this to bring out more of that tropicality and oak from our from our barrels to give it that kind of vanilla. And also we added a touch extra vanilla to create this harmonious kind of like structure beneath the passion fruit. So it's not just like a straight up cachaça infused with passion fruit. It's it's like it's got a lot going on, which makes it really user friendly. I was gonna say, like just once smelling this, it smells really delicious uh uh i you know obviously a very strong passion and you get the funkiness of the sugar cane um but tasting it is it's actually really complex right like you get hit with certain flavors up front and then you get the oak near the end and then you get hit again with the passion fruit for me at least um uh, at the end as well so I, it's actually really surprising and one of the things i was thinking of when i first started tasting this is is this meant to be a mixer or is it meant to actually sip straight as well? And the more I kind of uh, smell and play around with it, I could actually see myself like personally, like this is something I would drink like after a great meal, right? Like uh, straight up, like I could see doing that, obviously mixing as well, but how do you uh, envision people enjoying uh, at least the passion fruit uh, version of this? Great question. I mean, it's, it's intended specifically to be very versatile from the simplest, you know, just drinking it on a rock because it, it does have all of that complexity and flavor added to it um, to be mixed very simply with a single kind of highball mixer, right? In our case, we developed this mate tea, which is a great version of that, but mixes great with tonic, mixes great with soda. Um, and it's, it's meant to be a bit of a, um, I was going to say a bit of a chameleon, but we have another expression we named chameleon. So I'll use something different. It's, it's meant to be just really flexible um, depending on the environment, right? After dinner, you want something simple, something, you know, kind of palate cleansing. It can do that. For us, like at, at store tastings, you know, it's great to have a spirit that you can enjoy sipping room temp or on a rock that's not like silver cachaça. It's not as user friendly to be completely transparent to like be drinking room temp silver cachaça for the first time. This is a much more fun way to be introduced to the category of cachaça. And it's also very mixological too. We, we leaned on a lot of expertise from our trusted friends at some of the best bars in the United States to give us their feedback along the product development journey. Um, and that was important to us because despite being aimed definitely at kind of like, you know, the, the broader drinking public as like an entry point, it is something that we're just as proud of as our more elegant you know, single barrel expressions that, um, you know, are maybe the enthusiasts appreciate a little bit more. Yeah. And I was going to say too, is that uh, just to be clear, this is not a straight up just mix. Like you were saying, it's, it's uh, flexible because there is definitely alcohol forwardness in this. Like this is mm -hmm. not like a, you know, a passion fruit liqueur. Uh, this is, this is exactly. a real spirit. Um, and, yeah. Uh, it's foolproof. Yeah, at 40% 40, 40 is this bottle that I have. And uh, I yep. appreciate that tremendously because like trying to drink that yeah. straight out of liqueur, I'd be like, oh my goodness, yeah. I just got a mouthful of sugar. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is great. Uh, do you have any um, other like 
plans Sophie Tucker uh, or are they planning on bringing in uh, if you could talk about it other people that might be uh, in the spirit of collaboration uh, as well down that you know in the future yeah um so since you know since we started working with Sophie Tucker it has really uh profoundly impacted our, our brand in such positive ways right um and this fall, Sophie Tucker are launching a, a headline tour. They're releasing an album this year. Um, and so Noble Fogo is going to be, you know, looking to be a part of that as much as we can because the ethos of the whole partnership gets back to like creating these environments. That's what Sophie D Tucker does really, really well. If you go to one of their shows, it's not just the music. It's like the visuals, the fashion, the, you know, the good vibes of the people you're with. And now they've got this other element of like the drinks that can be part of that. Um, so we're going to be collaborating with them uh, and, and being a part of their tour rather um, for their headline tour. And I should also mention, you know, just kind of through this world, we've, we've gotten really close with some other fantastic artists who share this kind of ethos for creating good vibes and bringing good people together. Um, Sophie Tucker's dancers are called Bob's Dance Shop incredible group of, of dancers and choreographers that we've gotten to be really good friends with. And they are launching kind of their own incredible endeavors um, of holistic, just kind of music, art, dance, shows and gatherings. And so we're really excited to, to um, connect with them. And also through that world, some Brazilians in Los Angeles, based in Los Angeles, have, have Brazilian Americans have been um, creating a series of um, Again, it's kind of this multi-hyphenate party called BBL, BBL, that um, combines original music, dance, um, in this music genre from Brazil called Baile Funk that is really taking off in LA. They're producing shows in LA, in San Francisco, New York, um, and to see them embrace Novo Fogo as collaborators and partners. I mean, everybody, you look around, like everybody has a Novo Fogo canned drink in their hands at these parties. It's a total blast. And that's been another really amazing kind of subculture of Brazilian um, art and music that Novo Fogo is so, you know, humbled and proud to be the accompaniment to that. So I would say how do, all how of those do people find people more before. about this um, BBL, uh, these experiences that you're talking about, these partnerships? How, how do they, if I live in LA, how do I get more information and, and so I can go experience that? Great question. Um, Instagram is probably the best place to keep apprised of their, their um, calendar. So you should follow Sophie Tucker on Instagram, of course, because they announce all kinds of exciting content for their fans. They're very connected. Um, you should follow Bob's Dance Shop. You should follow BBL Originals. You should follow Novo Fogo. And I would say those are like some really great, uh, great compasses to some really rad, rad times. That's awesome. All right. So like really great insight into what you all are hoping to, or not hoping, but planning on doing. Uh, I, thank you for sharing also the fact that Sophie is, or Sophie Tucker is coming out with a new album later this year. Uh, it, I really truly believe that well-made uh, spirits and drinks bring experience and stories, right? That That's what uh, kind of compels us to sit around with each other and have an opportunity co to connect. Like you can do that, you know, without having, you know, food or, or drink, but it, it just is enriched so much more with that. And then, um, so like having Sophie Tucker as part of that story, having the story of like what Novo Fogo is doing in Brazil. And then now there's another tie in to, um, the BBL Brazilians in the U S working with y'all to bring, I, I feel like it's a highlight to the culture, right, of Brazil. Yeah, I fully agree. I think Brazilian culture is definitely at an inflection point in terms of how we in North America kind of get it. Um, you know, you've got these incredible artists like Anita bringing that baile funk to like, you know, dance clubs that are so fun. Um, and yeah, you're right. It's just, it's incredible to see this being, um, it's, this is kind of snowball effect is happening. You know, you've got Sophie Tucker's headline tour, for example, if you buy a ticket to the show in Portland, a dollar for every headline show ticket goes to support the Unendangered Forest Project through this amazing platform called Plus One. So 
you know, like in all of these cool creative ways, it's all about bringing people together, supporting each other and spreading that positivity from like Novo Fogo and Sophie Tucker all the way down to our, you know, our distributors, our, you know, bartenders we work with. It's, um, it's definitely given our, our, our brand identity a completely new fun texture. We really love. Yeah, I always say that any brand that uh, focuses on high quality product, that's one thing from an, uh, from a business perspective, like people will be drawn to uh, uh, companies that make high quality product. But the home run is always when there's some type of social cause uh, where you feel like you're giving back to a community that makes it outstanding, right? So it sounds like that is from day yeah. one, something that Nova Fogo is focused on. So uh, congratulations yeah. to y'all on that. I think that's a that's a huge deal and you're supporting um, something that is so critical, which is, you know, the Atlantic rainforest, the Atlantic Brazilian rainforest, which, um, you know, we're far removed from that, uh, but we're impacted by it, right? And uh, it, it's just a, a great uh, thing to hear about uh, that people care, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Dan, you know, one, um, one anecdote that comes to mind that kind of hits on all those points is becoming friends with um, an, an owner operator in Marlboro, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. His name is Louis Fernandez, definitely worth a follow on social media and check him out on, on YouTube. Um, he's a bartender. He runs a family kind of Brazilian restaurant and just like, you know, an, an epic drink creator and reviewer of spirits. And so, um, Louis has a very keen eye for, you know, the things he wants to support. He joined us on the Sophie Tucker trip to Brazil. We actually threw a dance party at our distillery um, and Sophie Tucker did a DJ set. So just like being able to meet somebody like Louis, learn even more about how he is kind of like someone who improves the culture and the awareness of Brazilian drinks in America. That's really kind of part and parcel of his mission. Um, and then just like looking over and seeing him dancing and, and then, you know, going to the bar and drinking the drinks that he consulted all the Brazilian bartenders on how to produce has been one of the many, many, many amazing relationships that have been kind of like during this chapter of Novo Fogo that I think is like a really cool encapsulation of what happens when you bring really talented, caring, compassionate people together. I was going to ask you what one of your most memorable experiences or stories uh, from your time at Novo Fogo. And I feel like you just kind of described one of those. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that was that was a really special trip. Another really special, tr special moment was almost exactly a year ago, Tales of the Cocktail 2023. It was the coming together of Sophie Tucker. We did a, a DJ set, kind of a pop up, like during the day, it was like, you know, 5pm, but we blacked out all the windows and turned it into this what we call like a jungle disco vibe. And these Tales attendees showed up and just had their faces blasted off with the fun of Brazilian drinks and Sophie Tucker music and dancing on the stage. It was like truly amazing. Bob's Dance Shop were there bringing all the vibes at the show. And then the next day, we, the, the Bobs do these amazing, you remember the, the flash mobs of like the kind of early aughts? They're bringing them back. They're calling them flash bobs. And we did a flash <laughs> bob on Bourbon Street where you just kind of, you know, come out of the woodwork. It was right after the Barbie movie came out. And so we like, did a remix of the Barbie girl, girl song that everybody's dancing to and innocent bystanders like completely bamboozled about what's happening. And, it, you know, again, it was one of those kind of whirlwinds that looking back, it was like, damn, so many people were so delighted by what they experienced because of this, you know, just confluence of good people and art and drinks and music. And the backdrop of all of it is that we're saving the rainforest while we're at it. And some people might have walked away from that weekend thinking, wow, I, I really like how Novo Fogo is such a sustainable company. And other people were like, I really dig that Novo Fogo does crazy dance parties in New Orleans. So it was just such a, you know, such a beautifully chaotic, awesome connection of everybody that I'll always remember. And creating, again, stories and experiences. I, I would have yeah. loved to see that. The whole flash mob thing is so much fun that I, you know, seen it on YouTube. I don't think I have never experienced one in person. I would be completely <laughs> floored. Uh, I would love that experience. I wish I was in New Orleans when you guys did that, because I can only imagine, honestly, what that that could have could have been like. Um, so oh, switching, wow. switching gears really quick, though, is um, yeah. what's a common myth or misconception about cachaça that you think uh, could be cleared up? You know, something I hear from a lot of people who have had cachaça, but maybe they had it on vacation, 
They had maybe a few too many caipirinhas. There's this impression that it's just kind of like a moonshiny kind of, um, you know, cheap, super alcoholic, gives you a bad hangover. I think probably a lot of spirits categories have suffered this chapter of like when it's building, right? Because uh, it's still pretty nascent and people who might have experienced it might have, you know, had some industrial cachaça in Costa Rica on the beach and like had a rough time. So that's number one. Um, and even in, in its home country, it still kind of battles that stigma of being like, you know, not super hip or like, you know, it's kind of like, why, why are you drinking cachaça? You go to the cool bars, you're drinking, you know, vodka and whiskey and stuff like this. So that at a high level, Dan, is like the biggest misconception that it's just kind of cheap, poorly made. It truly is one of the most diverse, you know, incredibly um, high volume spirit categories on, on earth. Usually it's around like number five, most consumed spirit in the world. Wow. Um, only 1% of it makes its way out of Brazil. So we're really just experiencing the tip of the iceberg, but I, I would put amazing cachaças up against the best of any spirits category. That's, that's uh, uh, amazing. I had no idea it was like the fifth uh, largest in the world. That's, yeah. that's pretty yeah, amazing. Huge. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. I'm going to run into a rapid fire round question for you. Uh, if you just throw oh, off, yeah. you know, whatever's top of mind, it's not, don't worry, it's nothing crazy. Uh, yeah. But you ready for this? Let's do it. All right. What's your go-to cocktail? Uh, Habo de Gallo. Rabo de Gallo, barrel aged cachaça, chinar, vermouth, orange bitters, stir it up, orange twist, delicious. Send me uh, that recipe after we talk. I would love to, to make that for myself. Um, favorite bar in Seattle? Ooh, um, favorite bar in Seattle? Uh, ooh, stumping me. Um, I'm going to go with um, the bar at Lorsen. All right. Favorite liquor besides cachaça? Tequila. I love tequila. Favorite place in Brazil? Mojeches. What's currently on your playlist? Don't say Sophie Tucker. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see here. I've been drinking, listening to a lot of Fred again. Fred again. All right. And who inspires you the most in your professional life? Um, great question. Uh, our master distiller, Dr. Ajinor Makari Jr. He taught me a whole lot about how to drink, how to, how to live. All right. And lastly, um, and I think you mentioned this earlier, but like, where can people find more information about Nova Fogo and stay updated on your latest releases. Follow us on Instagram as our, uh, our favorite social media channel, uh, just at Novo Fogo. Uh, check us out online, novofogo.com. And that's where you'll be kept up to date. I also recommend just joining our mailing list, which you can sign up through our website. Um, at the very bottom, you can sign up and we send out regular email updates about the events we're doing, the products we're releasing and all kinds of fun tidbits from the jungle. And hopefully, uh, you know, information about the new Sophie Tucker uh, album release and how you all are working with her on that. Uh, yeah. Or, and Tucker. Uh, yeah. Luke, anything else you want to share before we sign off? Let's see here. Um, well, Dan, thanks. This has been a really wonderful conversation. Um, I would say that, yeah, we're, we're really excited to share Brazilian drinks in all their forms. Um, you know, we've got spirits from passion fruit cachaça all the way up to really interesting age stuff so there's something for everybody there we make canned rtd drinks um and now we make non-alcoholic drinks so the main point of just kind of you know spouting out our product line again is just a reminder that cachaça can go wherever you want to be and with whatever friends you happen to be with Luke, thank you so much for joining me today i had a ton of fun learning more about novo fogo uh it was really informative because honestly, I, I didn't know a lot about it and, and you've provided me with a, a ton of information. So thank you so much. I can't wait to try that cocktail that you mentioned. I already forgot the name of it. What's the name of it again? Rabo de Gallo in Portuguese. Rabo de Gallo. It means oh. a tale of the rooster in Portuguese. Wow. Tale of the rooster. I want to try that. So please send that to me. Thanks again so much uh, for the manual. We are out.